Volume Three, Chapter Nine of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume Three, Chapter Nine. Et souvent au moment où l'on croyait tenir une espérance, on voit que c'est un souvenir. Victor Hugo. When Colonel Tempest lay in a precarious condition owing to the unexpected explosion of a revolver which he was taking to his gunmaker and which he believed to be unloaded, when this fatality occurred, Mrs. Courtney somewhat relaxed the usual stringency of her usual demeanour to him, and allowed his daughter to be with him constantly in the hospital to which he was first conveyed, and afterwards in his rooms in Brook Street, when he was sufficiently convalescent to be conveyed thither. Colonel Tempest was a trying patient. In one sense he was not a patient at all, melting into querulous tears when denied a sardine on toast for which his soul thirsted, the application of which would infallibly have separated his soul from his body, and bemoaning continually, when consciousness was vouchsafed to him, the neglect of his children and the callousness of his friends. Die bore it with equanimity. It is only true accusations which one feels obliged to contradict. She did not love her father, and his continual appeals to her pity and filial devotion touched her but little. Colonel Tempest confided to his nurse in the night watches that he was the parent of heartless children, and when Di took her place in the daytime, reviled the nurse's greed, who, whether he was suffering or not, could eat a large meal in the middle of the night. "'I hate nurses,' he would say. "'Your poor mother is such a horrid nurse when Archie was born. I could not bear her always making difficulties and restrictions, and locking the door, and then complaining to the doctor because I rattled the lock. I urged your mother to part with her whenever she was not in the room, but she only cried and said she could not do without her, and that she was kind to her. That was your mother all over. She always sided against me. I must say she knew the value of tears, did your poor mother. She cried herself into hysterics when I rang the front door bell at four in the morning, because I had gone out without a latch-key. I suppose you expected me to sit all night on the step. And first the nurse and then the doctor spoke to me about agitating her, and said it was doing her harm. So I just walked straight out of the house, and never set foot in it again for a month, till they had both cleared out. They overreached themselves that time. Archie, who looked in once a day for the space of ten seconds, came in for the largest share of Colonel Tempest's reproaches. I don't like sick people, that young gentleman was wont to remark. Don't understand them. No use. Nursing's not in my line. Better out of the way. So, with the consideration of his kind, he was so good as to keep out of it, while Colonel Tempest wept salt tears into his already too salt beef tea. It was always too salt or not salt enough, and remarked with bitterness that he could have fancied a sardine, and that other people's sons nursed their parents when they were at death's door. Young Grandcourt had never left his father's bedside for three weeks when he had pneumonia, but Archie, it seemed, was different. "'My children are not much comfort to me,' he told the doctor, as regularly as he put out his tongue. "'John might have come,' he said one day to die. "'He got out of it by sending a cheque, but I think he might have taken the trouble just to come and see whether I was alive or dead.' "'John is ill himself,' said Di. "'John is always ill,' said Colonel Tempest, fretfully, with the half-memory of convalescence, always ailing and coddling himself and yet he has twice my physique. John grows coarse-looking, very coarse. I fancy he's a large eater. I remember he was ill in the summer. I went to see him. I was always sitting with him, and there did not seem to be much the matter with him. I think he gives way. Perhaps it is a family failing, said Di, and she and Mrs. Courtney sat indoors all that afternoon, though there had been lent a carriage, and they waited to make tea till after the time and whenever the door-bell rang, Mrs. Courtney's hands shook quite as much as Di's. An aimless, foolish person's calls, but John did not call. "'He's ill,' said Mrs. Courtney in the dusk, "'or he's been prevented coming. There is some reason. He will write.' "'Yes,' said Di. "'He will come when he can.' But nevertheless a little shiver of doubt crept into her heart for the first time. "'If I had been in his place,' she said to herself, I should have come, ill or well, and I should not have been prevented. She put the thought aside instantly as unreasonable, but the shy dread she had previously felt of meeting him changed to a restless longing just to see him, just to be reassured. 
to be loved by one we love is after all so incredible a revelation that it is not wonderful that human nature seeks after a sign only a great self-esteem finds love easy to believe in the days passed and linked themselves to weeks was it fancy or did mrs courtney become graver day by day and i remembered with misgiving a certain note which she had written to John the morning she left Overly. The little cloud grew. One afternoon, Dai came in rather later than usual, and after a glance round the room, which had become habitual to her, sat down by her grandmother and poured out tea. Any callers, Granny? One, Archie. Dai sighed. Coming home had always the possibility in it of finding someone sitting in the drawing room or a note on the hall table yet neither possibility happened. Archie came to say that the doctor thinks your father does not gain ground, and that he might be moved to the seaside with advantage. He wanted to know whether you could go with him. He can't get leave himself for more than a couple of days. I said I would allow you to do so, if you took your father down himself and got him settled. He could do that in two days, and he ought to take his share. He has left everything to you so far. He mentioned— continued Mrs. Courtney with an effort, that he had met John at the Carlton yesterday, and that he was all right and able to go about again as usual. He went back to Overly today. There was a long silence. "'What do you think, Granny?' said Di at last. "'How long is it since you were at Overly?' Two months. "'When you were there, did you allow John to see that you had changed your mind, or were you friendly with him as you used to be?' Nothing discourages men so much as that. No, I tried to be, but I could not. I, I don't know what I was, except very uncomfortable. Had he any real opportunity of speaking to you without interruption? I remembered the half-hour in the entresol sitting-room. It had never occurred to her till that moment that certainly, if he wished to do so, he could have spoken to her then. Yes, she said, he had. And, she added, I'm sure he knew I liked him. If he did not know it then, I'm quite sure he knows it now. I wrote a note. What kind of note? Oh, Granny, that is just it. I don't know what kind it was. It seemed natural at the time. I can't remember exactly what I said. I've tried to, often. It was written in such a hurry. For you telegraphed for me, and I, I've been up all night waiting to hear whether he was to live or die, and it was so dreadful to have to go away without a word. Mrs. Courtley leaned back in her chair. She seemed tired. "'Tell me what you think,' said Di again. "'I think,' said Mrs. Courtney, "'that if John had been seriously attached to you, "'he would either have come "'or have answered your letter by this time. "'I'm afraid we have made a mistake.' Di did not answer. The world was crumbling down around her. "'I may be making one now,' said Mrs. Courtney, but it appears to me he has had every opportunity given him, and he has made no use of them. Men worth their salt make their opportunities, but if they don't even take them when they are ready made to their hand, they cannot be in earnest. Women don't realise what a hateful position a man is in who is deeply in love and who has no knowledge of whether it is returned or not. He won't remain in it any longer than he can help. John is not in that position, said Di colouring painfully. Granny, why don't you reproach me for writing that letter? Because, my dear, though I regret it more than I can say, I should have done the same in your place. And what would you do now in my place? This, said Mrs. Courtney, you cannot dismiss the subject from your mind, but whenever it comes into your thoughts, hold steadily before you the one fact that he is certainly aware you are attached to him and he has not acted on that knowledge. "'They say men don't care for anything when once they know they can't have it,' said Di hoarsely, pride wringing the words out of her. "'Perhaps John is like that. He knows I am only waiting to be asked.' "'Fools say many things,' returned Mrs. Courtney. "'That is about as true as that women don't care for their children when they get them. A few unnatural ones don't. The others do.' I've seen much trouble caused by love affairs. After middle life, most people decry them. 
especially those who have had superficial ones themselves. For there is seldom any love at all in the mutual attraction of two young people, and the elders know very well that if it is judiciously checked, it can also be judiciously replaced by something else. But a real love which comes to nothing is more like the death of an only child than anything else. It is a death. The great thing is to regard it so. I have known women go on year after year waiting, as we have been doing during the last two months, refusing to believe in its death, believing instead in some misunderstanding, building up theories to account for alienation, clinging to the idea that things might have turned out differently if only so-and-so had been more tactful, if they had not refused a certain invitation, if something they had said which might yet be explained had not been misconstrued. And all the time there is no misunderstanding, no need of explanation. The position is simple enough. No man is daunted by such things except in women's imaginations. What men want they will try to obtain, unless there is some positive bar, such as poverty. And if they don't try, remember the inference is sure that they don't really want it. Di did not answer. Her face had taken a set look, which for the first time reminded Mrs. Courtney of her mother. She had often seen the other Diana look like that. "'My child,' she said, stretching out her soft old hand, and laying it on the cold, clenched one. "'A death, even of what is dearest to us, and a funeral, and a headstone to mark the place, hard as it is, is as nothing compared to the death in life of an existence which is always dragging about a corpse.' I have seen that not once nor twice. I want to save you from that. Di laid her face for a moment on the kind hand. I will bury my dead, she said. End of Volume 3, Chapter 9、Volume、three, Chapter 10 3, of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume three, chapter ten. And now we believe in evil where once we believed in good. The world, the flesh, and the devil are easily understood. Gordon. It seems a pity that our human destinies are too often so constituted that with our own hands we may annul in one hour, one hour of weakness. The long, slow work of our strength, and now the self conquest and the renunciation of our best years. We ought to be thankful when the gate of the irrevocable closes behind us, and the power to defeat ourselves is at last taken from us. For he who has once solemnly and with conviction renounced, and then, for no new cause, has taken to himself again that which he renounced, has broken the mainspring of his life. John went early the following morning to London, for he had business with three men, and he could not rest till he had seen them, and had shut that gate upon himself for ever. So early had he started that it was barely midday when he reached Lord Frederick's chambers. The valet told him that his lordship was still in bed, and could see no one, but John went up to his bedroom and knocked at the door. "'It is I, John Tempest,' he said, and went in. Lord Frederick was sitting up in bed, sallow and shrunk like a mummy, in a blue watered silk dressing gown. His thin hair was brushed up into a crest on the top of his head. The bed was littered with newspapers and letters. There was a tray before him, and he was in the act of chipping an egg as John came in. He raised his eyebrows and looked first with surprised displeasure, and then with attention, at his visitor. Good morning, he said. And he went on tapping his egg. Ah, he said, shaking his head, hard boiled again. John looked at him as a plague stricken man might look at the carcass of some obscene animal found rotting in his water spring. Lord Frederick's varied experiences had made him familiar with the premonitory symptoms of those outbursts of anger and distress which he designated under the all embracing term of seam. He felt idly curious to know what this man, with his fierce white face, had to say to him. Blige me by sitting down, he said. You're in my light. I, I have been reading my mother's letters to you, 
said John, still standing in the middle of the room and stammering in his speech. He had not reckoned for the blind paroxysm of rage which had sprung up at the mere sight of Lord Frederick, and was spinning him like a leaf in a whirlwind. Indeed, said Lord Frederick, raising his eyebrows and carefully taking the shell off his egg. I don't care about reading old letters myself, especially the private correspondence of other people. But taste stiffer. You do, it seems. I'd imagine the particular letters you allude to had been burnt. My mother intended to burn them. It would certainly have been wiser to do so, but probably for that reason they remain undestroyed. From time immemorial womankind has shown a marked repugnance to the dictates of common sense. I have burnt them. No, just so, said Lord Frederick, helping himself to salt. I commend your prudence. Had you burnt them unread, I should have been able to commend your sense of honour also. What do you know about honour? said John. The two men looked hard at each other. That remark, said Lord Frederick, joining the ends of his fingers and half shutting his eyes, is a direct insult. To insult a man with whom you are not in a position to quarrel is, in my opinion, John, an error of judgment. We will consider it one, and as such I will let it pass. The letters, I presume, contain nothing of which you were not already aware. Only the fact that I am your illegitimate son. I deplore your courses of expression. You certainly have not inherited it from me. But, my dear Galahad, it is impossible that even your youth and innocence should not have known of my tendresse for your mother. Is that the last new name for adultery? said John, huskily, advancing a step nearer the bed. His face was livid, his eyes burned. He held his hands clenched, lest they should rush out and wrench away all semblance of life and humanity from that figure in the watered silk dressing-gown. Lord Frederick lay back on his pillows, and looked at him steadily. He was without fear, but it appeared to him that he was about to die. The laws of his country, of conscience, and of principle, all the protection that envelops life, seemed to have receded from him, to have slipped away into the next room, or downstairs with the valet. They would come back, no doubt, in time, but they might be a little late as far as he was concerned. Me a strong hand like mine, he said to himself, his pale, unflinching eyes fixed upon his son's, while a remembrance slid through his mind of how once, years ago, he choked the life out of a mastiff which had turned on him, and how long the heavy brute had taken to die. Do not spill the coffee, he said quietly, after a moment. John started violently and wheeled away from him like a man regaining consciousness on the brink of an abyss. Lord Frederick put out his lean hand, and went on with his breakfast. There was a long silence. John, said Lord Frederick at last, not without a certain dignity, the world is as it is. We did not make it, and we are not responsible for it. If there is anyone who set it going, it is his own lookout. Reproach him if you can find him. All we have to do is to live in it. And we can't live in it. I tell you, we can't exist in it with any comfort until we realise that it is rotten to the core. John was leaning against the window sill, shaking like a reed. It seemed to him that for one awful moment he had been in hell. I do not pretend to be better than other men, continued Lord Frederick. Men and women are men and women. And if you persist in thinking them angels, especially the latter, you will pay for your mistake. I am paying said John. Uh, possibly. You seem to have sustained a shock. It is incredible to me that you did not know beforehand what the letters told you. Wedding rings don't make a greater resemblance between father and son than there is between you and me. Lord Frederick looked at the stooping figure of the young man, leaning spent and motionless against the window, his arms hanging by his sides. He held what he called his prudishness in contempt, but he respected an element in him which he would have termed grit. "'You are stronger built than I am, John,' he said, with a touch of pride, "'and wider in the chest. "'Come, bygones are bygones. Shake hands.' "'I can't,' said John. "'I don't know that I could on my account, but anyhow not on hers.' "'Ha, <laughs> ha! 
and so this was the information which you rushed in without leave to spring upon me. It was, together with the fact that, of course, I withdraw in favour of Colonel Tempest, the heir at law. I am going on to him from here. Lord Frederick reared himself slowly in his bed, his brown hands clutching the bedclothes like eagle talons. You are going to own your— My shame, yes, not yours. You need not be alarmed. Your name shall not be brought in. If I take the name of Fane, it would only be because it was my mother's. But you said you had burned the letters. I have. I don't see what difference that makes. The fact that they are burnt does not alter the fact that I am nobody, and he is the legal heir. And you mean to tell him so? I do. To commit suicide? Social suicide? Yes. Fool, said Lord Frederick, in a voice which lost none of its force because it was barely above a whisper. John did not answer. Leave the room, said the outraged parent, turning his face to the wall, the bedclothes and the tray trembling exceedingly. I will have nothing more to do with you. You do not come to me when you are penniless, do you hear? I disown you. Leave me. I will never speak to you again. I hope to God you never will, said John. And he took up his hat and went out. He had settled his account with the first of the three people whom he had come to London to see. From Lord Frederick's chambers he went straight to Colonel Tempest's lodgings in Brook Street. But Colonel Tempest had that morning departed with his son to Brighton, and John, momentarily thrown off his line of action by that simple occurrence, stared blankly at the landlady, and then went to his club and sat down to write to him. There was no question of waiting. Like a man walking across Niagara on a tightrope, there was no time to think or hesitate or look round. John kept his eyes riveted to one point and shut his ears to the roar of the torrent below him in which a moment's giddiness would engulf him. It was afternoon by this time. As he sat writing at a table in one of the bay windows, a familiar voice spoke to him. It was Lord Hemsworth. They had not met since the night of the ice carnival. Lord Hemsworth's face had quite lost its boyish expression. "'I hope you are better, Tempest,' he said, with obvious constraint, looking narrowly at him. Could Di's accepted lover wear so grey and stern a look as this? John replied that he was well, and then, with sudden recollection of Mitty's account of Lord Hemsworth's conduct during that memorable night, began to thank him, and stopped short. The room was empty. It was on her account, said Lord Hemsworth. John did not answer. It was that conviction which had pulled him up. Lord Hemsworth waited some time for John to speak, and then he said, you know about me, Tempest, and why I was on the ice that night? Well, I've kept out of the way for three months under the belief that I should hear any day that uh, I'm not such a fool as to pit myself against you. I, I don't want to be a nuisance, sir, but it's three months. For God's sake, tell me, are you on or are you not? I am not, said John. Then I will try my luck, said the other. He went out, and John knew that he'd gone to try it there and then and sat motionless with his hand across his mouth and his unfinished letter before him until the servant came to close the shutters. End of Volume 3 Chapter 10volume three chapter eleven of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Simon Evers Volume three, chapter eleven. We live together years and years, and leave unsounded still each other's springs of hopes and fears, each other's depths of will. Lord Houghton. But still more bewildering is the way in which we live years and years with ourselves in an entire ignorance of the powers that lie dormant beneath the surface of character. The day comes when vital forces of which we know nothing arise within us and break like glass the even tenor of our lives. The quiet hours, the regulated thoughts, the peaceful aspiration after things but little set above us, where are they? The angel with the sword drives us out of our Eden to shiver in the wilderness of an entirely changed existence, unrecognisable by ourselves, 
though perhaps lived in the same external groove, the same divisions of time, among the same faces as before. Day succeeded day in Di's life, each day adding one more stone to the prison in which it seemed as if an inexorable hand were walling her up. I will not give in. I will turn my mind to other things, she said to herself. And there were no other things. All lesser lights were blown out. The heart, when it is swept into the grasp of a great love, is ruthlessly torn from the hundred minute ties and interests that heretofore held it to life. The little fibres and tendrils of affections which have gradually grown round certain objects are snapped off with from the roots. They cease to exist. The pang of love is that there is no escape from it. It has the same tension as sleeplessness. Di struggled and was not defeated. But some victories are as sad as defeats. During the struggle she lost something, what was it, that had been to many her greatest charm. Women were unanimous in deploring how she had gone off. There was a thinness in her cheek, and a blue line under her deep eyes. Her beauty remained, but it was not the same beauty. Mrs. Courtney noticed with a pang that she was growing like her mother. Easter came, and with it the wedding of Miss Crupps and the Honourable Augustus Lumley, youngest son of Lord Mortgage. Miss Crupp's young heart had long inclined towards Mr. Lumley, but on the occasion of seeing him blacked as a Christy minstrel, she finally succumbed into a state of giggling admiration which plainly showed the state of her affections. So he cut the word yes out of a newspaper, and told her that was what she was to say to him, and, amid a series of delighted cackles, they were engaged. Di went to the wedding looking so pale that it was whispered that Mr. Lumby and his tambourine had won her heart as well as that of his adoring bride. On a Sunday afternoon shortly afterwards, Di was sitting alone indoors, her grandmother having gone out driving with a friend. She told herself that she ought to go out, but she remained sitting with her hands in her lap. Every duty, every tiny decision, every small household matter had become of late an intolerable burden. Even to put a handful of flowers into water required an effort of will which it was irksome to make. She had stayed in to make an alteration in the gown she was to wear that night at the speaker's. As she looked at the card to make sure it was the right evening, she remembered that it was at the speaker's she had first met John just a year ago. One year! How absurd! Five, ten, fifteen! She tried to recollect what her life could have been like before he had come into it but it seemed to start from that point, and to have had no significance before. "'I must go out,' she said again, and at that moment the doorbell rang, and although Mrs. Courtney was out, someone was admitted. The door opened, and Lord Hemsworth was announced. "'There is, but men are fortunately not in a position to be aware of it, a lamentable uniformity in their manner of opening up certain subjects.' Di knew in a moment from previous experience what he had come for. He wondered, as he stumbled through a labyrinth of platitudes about the weather, how he could broach the subject without alarming her. He did not know that he had done so by his manner of coming into the room, and that he had been refused before he had finished shaking hands. Di was horribly sorry for him while he talked about whatever he did talk about. Neither noticed what it was at the time, or remembered it afterwards. She was grateful to him for not alluding even in the most distant manner to their last meeting. She remembered that she had clung to him, and that he had called her by her Christian name, but she was too callous to be ashamed at the recollection. It was as if nothing compared to another humiliation which had come upon her a little later. "'It's no good beating about the bush,' said Lord Hemsworth at last, after he had beaten it till there was, so to speak, nothing left of it. "'I've come up to London for one thing, and I've come here for one thing which is—' "'To ask you to marry me. Don't speak. Don't say anything just for the moment,' he continued hurriedly, raising his hand as if to ward off a rebuff. "'For God's sake, don't stop me. I've kept it in so long, I must say it, and you must hear me.' She let him say it, and he got it out with stumbling and difficulty and long gaps between, got out in shaking commonplaces a tithe of the love he had for her. And all the time I thought if it might only have been someone else who was uttering those halting words. 
I wonder how many men have proposed and been accepted while the woman has said to herself, if it had only been someone else. Despair at his inability to express himself and at her silence seized him, as if it mattered a pin how he expressed himself if she had been willing to listen. "'If you understood,' he said over and over again, with the monotonous reiteration of a piano-tuner, "'you would not refuse me. I know you are going to, but if only you understood, you would not. You would not have the heart. It's, it's just everything to me.' And Lord Hemsworth, O oh, bathos of modern life, looked into his hat. "'Lord Hemsworth,' said I, "'have I ever given you any encouragement?' "'None,' he replied. "'People might think you have, but you never did. I knew better. I, I never misunderstood you. I, I know you don't care a straw about me, but, oh, die, you have not your equal in the world. There's no woman to compare with you. I didn't see how you could care for any one like me. Of course you don't. I would not expect it. But if—' If you would only marry me, I would be content with very little. I have looked at it all round. I, I would be content with very little. There was a long silence. What woman whose love has been slighted can easily reject a great devotion? I think, said Di, after several false starts to speak, that if I only considered myself, I would marry you. But there is the happiness of one other person to think of. Yours. I can't have any apart from you. You would have none with me. If it is miserable to care for anyone who is indifferent, it would be a thousand times more miserable to be married to that person. Not if it were you. Yes, if it were I. I, I, I would take the risk, said Lord Hemsworth, who held, in common with most men, the rooted conviction that a woman would become attached to any husband, however little she cares for her lover. It is precisely this conviction which makes the average marriages of the present day such mediocre affairs, which serves to place worldly or facile women, or those whose affections have never been called out, at the head of so many homes, as the mothers of the new generation from which we hope so much. "'I would take any risk,' repeated Lord Hemsworth doggedly. "'I'd rather be unhappy with you than happy with any one else.' "'You think so now,' said Di. But the time will come when you'd see that I had cut you off from the best thing in the world, from the love of a woman who would care for you as much as you do for me. I don't want her, I want you. I cannot marry you. Lord Hemsworth clutched blindly at the arms of the chair. I, I would wait any time. Di shook her head. A any time, he stammered. G go away for a year and uh, come back. It would be no good. Then he lost his head. So, so long as you don't care for anyone else, he said incoherently. I thought of the carnival. That is why I've kept out of the way. But I met Tempest today at the Carlton, and I asked him straight out, and he, he said there was nothing between you and him. I suppose you've refused him like the rest of us. Oh, my God, Di, they say you have no heart. It isn't true, is it? Don't refuse me. Don't make me live without you. I've tried for three months. And Lord Hemsworth's face worked. If you knew what it was like, you wouldn't send me back to it. Every vestige of colour had faded from Di's face at the mention of John. I don't care enough for you to marry you, she said, pitiless in her great pity. I wish I did, but I don't. D do you care for anyone else? Di saw that nothing short of the truth would wrest his persistence from its object. Yes, I do she said passionately, trembling from head to foot, for someone who does not care for me. You and I are both in the same position. Do you see now how useless it is to talk of this any longer? Both had risen to their feet. Lord Hemsworth looked at Di's white, convulsed face, and his own became as ashen. He saw at last that he had no more chance of marrying her than if she were lying at his feet in her coffin. Constancy, which can compass many things, avails naught sometimes. "'I beg your pardon,' he said, holding out his hand to go. "'I think I ought to beg yours,' she said brokenly, while their hands clasped tightly each in each. "'I never meant to make you as unhappy as, as I am myself, but yet I have.' They looked at each other with tears in their eyes. "'It does not matter,' said Lord Hemsworth hoarsely. I shall be all right. It's, it's you I think of. Don't stand. Mustn't stand. You're too tired. 
Goodbye. Di flung herself down on her face on the sofa as the door closed. She had forgotten Lord Hemsworth's existence the moment after he had left the room. John had told him that there was nothing between her and himself. John had told him that. John had said that. A cry escaped her, and she strangled it in the cushion. Hope does not always die when we imagine it does. It is subject to long trances. The hope which she had thought dead was only giving up the ghost now. Chaque espérance est un œuf, du peur sortir un serpent au lieu d'une colonne. Out of that frail shell of a cherished hope lying broken before her, the serpent had crept at last. It moved, it grew before her eyes. Slighted love is sad to bide. End of Volume 3, Chapter 11Volume three, chapter twelve of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume three, chapter twelve. We met hand to hand, we clasped hands close and fast, as close as oak and ivy stand. But it is past. Christina Rossetti. Half false, half fair, all feeble. Swinburne. When John roused himself from the long stupor into which he had fallen after Lord Hemsworth's departure, he put his finished letter to Colonel Tempest into an envelope, and then remembered with annoyance that he did not know how to address it. When the landlady in Brook Street had told him that Colonel and Captain Tempest had gone to Brighton that morning, he had been too much taken aback at the moment to think of asking for their address. He was too much exhausted in mind and body to go back to the lodgings for it immediately. He wrote a second letter, this time to his lawyer, and then, conscious of the state of his body by the shaking hand and clumsy, tardy brain, which made of a short and explicit statement so lengthy an affair, he mechanically changed his clothes, dined, and sat watching the smoke of his cigar. Presently, with food and rest, the apathy into which exhaustion had plunged him lifted, and the restlessness of a tortured mind returned. He had only as yet seen one of the three men whom he had come to London to interview, namely Lord Frederick. Colonel Tempest, the second, was out of town, but probably the third, Lord Jones, the minister, was not. It was close on ten o'clock. He should probably find him in his private room in the house. John flung away his cigar, and was in a few minutes spinning towards the Houses of Parliament in a hansom. He had not thought much about it till now. But as he turned in at the gates, the lines of the great buildings suddenly brought back to him the remembrance of his own ambition, and of the splendid career that had seemed to be opening before him when last he had passed those gates, which had fallen at a single touch like a house of cards, a house built with fortune's cards. There was a queue of carriages at the speaker's entrance. A party was evidently going on there. John went to the house and inquired for Lord Jones. He was not there. Perhaps he was at the Speaker's reception. John remembered, or thought he remembered, that he had a car for it, and went on there. His mind was set on finding Lord Jones. History repeats itself, and so does our little private history. Only when the same thing happens it finds us changed, and we look back at what we were last time, and remember our old young self with wonder. Was that indeed I? Possibly, to some, an evening party may appear a small event, but to die, as she stood in the same crowd as last year, in the same pictured rooms, it seemed to her that her whole life had turned on the pivot of that one evening a year ago. The lights glared too much now. The babble dazed her. Noises had become sharp swords of late. Everyone talked too loud. She chatted and smiled, and vaguely wondered that her friends recognised her. I am not the same person, she said to herself, but no one seems to see any difference. Presently she found herself near the same arched window where she had stood with John last year. She moved for a moment to it and looked out. There was a mist across the river. The light struggled through, blurred and feeble. It had been clear last year. 
She turned and went on talking, of she knew not what, to a very young man at her elbow, who was making laborious efforts to get on with her. Her eyes looked back from the recess across the sea of faces and fringes and bald and close-cropped heads. The men, who were not John, but yet had a momentary resemblance to him, were the only people she distinctly saw. Tall, fair men were beginning to complain of her unrecognising manner. Yes, history repeats itself. Among the crowd of the distance she suddenly saw him. John's rugged profile and square head were easy to recognise. He had said there was nothing between them. Their last meeting rushed back upon her with a scathing recollection of, of how she had held him in her arms and pressed her face to his. Shame scorched her inmost soul. She turned towards her companion with fuller attention than what she had previously accorded him. As John walked through the rooms, scanning the crowd, the possibility of meeting Di did not strike him. With a frightful clutch of the heart he caught sight of her. A man, who instantly aroused his animosity, was talking eagerly to her. Something in her appearance startled him. Was it the colour of her gown that made her look so pale? The intense light that gave her calm, dignified face that peculiar, worn expression? She had a faint, fixed smile as she talked that John did not recognise, and that, why he knew not, cut him to the quick. Was this Di? Could this be Di? He knew she had seen him. He hesitated a moment and then went towards her. She received him without any change of countenance. The fixed smile was still on her lips as he spoke to her, but the lips had whitened. Their eyes met for a moment. Oh, what had happened to Di's lovely eyes that used to be so grave and gay? He stammered something, said he was looking for someone, and passed on. She turned to speak to someone else as he did so. He strangled the nameless emotion which was choking him, and made his way into the next room. He had a vague consciousness of being spoken to, and of making Herculean efforts to grind out answers, and then of pouncing on the secretary of the man he was looking for, who told him his chief had suddenly and unexpectedly started for Paris that afternoon on affairs of importance. John mechanically noted down his address in Paris, and left the house. The necessity of remembering where his feet were taking him recalled him somewhat to himself. He pulled himself together and slackened his pace. "'I'll go to Paris by the night express,' he said to himself, the feverish longing for action increasing upon him as this new obstacle met him. He dared not remain in London. He knew for a certainty that if he did he should go and see Di. Neither could he write to Lord Jones all that he must tell him, or put into black and white the favour he had to ask of him. The first favour John had ever needed to ask, namely, to be helped by means of Lord Jones's interest to some post in which he could for the moment support himself and Mitty. As he turned up St. James's Street, he remembered with irritation that he had not yet procured Colonel Tempest's and Archie's address. While he hesitated whether to go on, that is, it was, to Brook Street for it, he remembered that he could probably obtain it much nearer at hand, namely at Archie's rooms in Piccadilly. Archie, who was a person of much pink and monogrammed correspondence, would probably have left his address behind him, stuck in the glass of the mantelpiece, as his manner was. The latch-key he had lent John in the autumn, when John had made use of his rooms, was still on his chain. He had forgotten to return it. He let himself in, went upstairs to the second floor, and opened the door of the little sitting-room. "'Here you are at last,' said a woman's voice. He went in quickly and shut the door behind him. A small woman in shimmering evening dress, with diamonds in her hair, came towards him and stopped short with a little scream. It was Madeline. He looked at her in silence, standing with his back to the door. A smouldering fire in his eyes seemed to burn her, for she shrank away to the further end of the room. John observed that there was a fire and lamps and knit his brows. Some persons are unable to perceive when explanations are useless. Madeline began one, something about Archie's difficulties, money, etc. But John cut her short. "'You are not accountable to me for your actions,' he said. "'Keep your explanations for your husband.' 
He looked again with perplexity at the fire and the lamps. He knew Archie had gone that morning on three days' leave to Brighton with his father. "'Let me go,' she said, whimpering. "'I, I won't stay here to be thought ill of, to, to have evil imputed to me.' "'You will answer one question first, said John. "'You impute evil to me. I, I know you do,' said Madeline, beginning to cry. "'But it's your, your own coarse mind that sees wickedness in everything.' "'Possibly,' said John. "'When do you expect, Archie?' "'Any moment. I wish he was here that he might tell you.' "'Thank you. That will do. You can go now.' He opened the door. She drew a long cloak over her shoulders and passed him without speaking, looking like what she was, one of that class whose very existence she professed to ignore, but whose ranks she had virtually joined when she announced her engagement at Sir Sir Henry in the morning post. Perhaps, inasmuch as that, untempted, she had sold herself for diamonds and position, instead of under strong temptation for the bare necessities of life like her poorer sisters, she was more degraded than they. But fortunately for her, and many others in our midst, Society upheld her. John looked after her, and then followed her. There was not a soul on the common staircase or in the hall. He passed out just behind her, and they were in the street together. "'Take my arm,' he said, and she took it mechanically. He signalled a four-wheeler and helped her into it. "'Where do you wish to go?' he said. "'I don't know,' she said feebly, apparently too much scared to remember what her arrangements had been. John considered a moment. "'Where is Sir Henry?' "'Dining at Woolwich.' "'Can't you go home?' "'No, no, it is much too early. I'm, I'm dressed for I, I said I was going—' uh, "'And I have left there already, and the, uh, the carriage is waiting there still.' "'You must go back there,' said John. "'Get your carriage and go home in it.' He gave the cabman the address and paid him. Then he returned to the cab door. "'Lady Verelst,' he said, less sternly, "'believe me.' Archie is not worth it. You don't understand, she tried to say with an assumption of injured dignity. It was only that I— He is not worth it, said John, with emphasis. And he shut the door of the cab and watched it drive away. Then he went back to Archie's room and sat down to consider. A faint odour of scent hung about the room. He got up and flung open the window. Years afterwards, if a woman used that particular scent— the same loathing disgust returned upon him. "'He took three days' leave to nurse his father at Brighton with the intention of coming back here to-night,' John said to himself. "'He'll be here directly.' And he made up his mind what he would do. And in truth, a few minutes later, a hansom rattled to the door, and Archie came in, breathless with haste. He looked eagerly round the room, and then, as he caught sight of the unexpected occupant, his face crimsoned, and he grinned nervously. "'She is gone,' said John, without moving. Uh, "'Gone? Who? I don't know what you mean.' "'No, of course not. What made you so late?' "'Train broke down outside London.' "'I came here to get your address at Brighton, because I have news for you. "'You are there at this moment, aren't you, looking after your father?' Archie did not answer. He only grinned and showed his teeth. John was aware that, though he stood quietly enough by the table, turning over some loose silver in his pocket— he was in a state of blind fury. He also knew that if he waited a little it would pass. Something in John's moral and physical strength had always the power to quell Archie's fits of passion. "'I had no intention of prying on you,' said John, after an interval. "'I wanted your address at Brighton, and I could not wait till to-morrow for it. I am going to Paris to-night on business, and, as it is yours as much as mine, you will go with me.' Archie never indulged in those flowers of speech with which some adorn their conversation. But there are exceptions to every rule, and he made one now. He culled, so to speak, one large bouquet of the choicest epithets, and presented it to John. He knew not what to say, and so he swore. That is why men swear often, and women seldom. "'I shall not leave you in London with that woman,' said John calmly. "'You will go to her if I do.' I, "'I shall do as I think fit,' stammered Archie, striking the table with his slender white hand. "'There you err,' said John. "'You will start with me in half an hour for Paris.'" End of Volume 3, Chapter 12
Volume three, chapter thirteen of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume three, chapter thirteen. There's not a crime but takes its proper change out still in crime, if once rung on the counter of this world. Elizabeth Barrett Browning. There is in Paris, just out of the Rue de Bac, a certain old fashioned hotel, the name of which I forget with a little cur in the middle of the rambling old building, and a thin fountain perennially plashing therein, adorned by a few pigeons and feathers on the brink. It had been a very fashionable hotel in the days when Madame Mole held her salon near at hand. But the old order changes. It was superseded now. Why John often went there I don't know. He probably did not know himself, unless it was for the sake of quiet. Anyhow, he and Archie arrived there together that morning, for it is needless to say that, having determined to get Archie at any cost out of London, John had carried his point, as he had done on previous occasions, to the disgust of the sulky young man, who proved anything but a pleasant travelling companion, and who, late in the afternoon, was still invisible behind the white curtains in one of the two little bedrooms that opened out of the sitting-room in which John was walking up and down. He put several questions to Archie respecting the state of his father's health, and that gentleman had assured him he was all right, quite able to look after himself, no need for him to remain with him. "'Of course not,' said John, or you would not have left him. "'But is he able to attend to business?' "'Rather,' said Archie, with the emphasis of ignorance. As long as Archie was in the next room, out of harm's way, John did not want his company. He knew that when he did appear he had to tell him that for eight and twenty years he had lived on Colonel Tempest's substance and then he must post the letter lying ready written on the table to Colonel Tempest, only needing the address. After that, life was a blank. Archie would rush home, of course. John did not know where he should go, except that it would not be with Archie. Back to Overley? No. And with a sudden choking sensation he realised that he should not see Overley again. He wondered what Mitty was doing at that moment whether the horse-chestnut against the nursery window would ever burst to leaf. Here in Paris they were out. He had noticed them as he returned from an interview with Lord Jones. That gentleman had been much pressed for time, but had nevertheless accorded him a quarter of an hour. He was genuinely perturbed by the disclosure the young man made to him, deplored the event as it affected John, but after the first moment was obviously more concerned about the seat and the loss of the Tempest's support than the wreck of John's career. After a decorous interval, Lord Jones had put a few questions to him about Colonel Tempest, his age, political views, etc. John perceived with what intentions these questions were put, and they made it the harder for him to ask the great man to help him to a livelihood. As John spoke and the elder man's eyes sought his watch, John experienced for the first time the truth of the saying that the highest price that can be paid for anything is to have to ask for it. If it had not been for Mitty, he could not have forced himself to do it. "'But, my dear uh, uh, Tempest,' said Lord Jones, "'surely we need not anticipate that uh, your uncle, uh, that Colonel Tempest, will fail to make a suitable provision for one who... Uh, who... "'He may offer to do so,' replied John. "'But if he did, I, I should not take it. He is not the kind of man for whom it is possible to accept money.' Still under the circumstances, in the extraordinary combination of circumstances, I should advise you to—my time is so circumscribed—I should certainly advise you to—you see, Tempest, with every feeling of regard for yourself and your father, <coughs> Mr. Tempest, before you, it is difficult for a person situated as I am at the present moment to offer you, on, on the eve of the general election, any position at all adequate to your undeniably great abilities. We shall not hear much more of my great abilities now that I am penniless said John, with bitterness. If I can get any kind of employment by which I can support myself and an old servant, I should be thankful. Lord Jones promised to do his best. He felt obliged to add that he could do but little, but he would do what he could. John might rest assured of that. In the meantime, he looked anxiously at the watch on the table. John understood, and took his leave. Lord Jones pressed him warmly by the hand, commended his conduct, once more deplored the turn events had taken, 
which he should consider as strictly private until they had been publicly announced, and assured him he would keep in him his mind and communicate with him immediately should any vacancy occur that, etc., etc. John retraced his steps wearily to the hotel. The loss of his career had stung him yesterday. How to keep Mitty in comfort seemed of far greater importance to today. How to provide a home for her with a little kitchen in it. John wondered whether he and Mitty could live on a hundred a year. He knew a good deal about the ways and means of the working classes, but of how the poor of his own class lived he knew nothing. But even the thought of Mitty could not hold him long. His mind ever went back to die with an agony of despair and rapture. During these three interminable months during which he had not seen her, he pictured her to himself as taking life as usual, wondering perhaps sometimes, yes, certainly wondering, why he did not come. But it had never struck him that she would be unhappy. When he saw her he had suddenly realised that the same emotions which had rent his soul had left their imprint on her face. Could women really love like men? Could Di actually, after her own fashion, feel towards him one tithe of the love he felt for her? John recognised with an exultation which for the moment transfigured as by far the empty desolation of his heart, that the change had been wrought in Di was his own work. Her cheek had grown pale for him, her eyes had wept for him. Her very beauty had become dimmed for his sake. "'I shall go mad,' said John, starting to his feet. "'Why is that damned letter still unposted?' Purpose was melting within him. The irrevocable step even now had not been taken. Lord Jones and his own lawyer would say nothing if at the eleventh hour he drew back. He must act finally this instant, or he would never act at all. He went into the next room where Archie was languidly shaving himself in a pink silk peignoir, and obtained from him Colonel Tempest's address. He addressed the letter, and took his hat and stick. "'I will post it myself this instant,' he said to himself. He went quickly downstairs and across the little court, scattering the pigeons. His face looked worn and ravaged in the vivid sunshine. He passed under the archway into the street, and as he did so two well-dressed men came out of a café on the opposite side. Before he had gone many steps one of them crossed the road and raised his hat, holding out a card. Uh, "'Mr. Tempest of Overly, I think,' he said respectfully. John stopped and looked at the man. He did not know him. The decipher's moment had come even before posting the letter. "'Now or never,' whispered Conscience. "'My name is Fane.' he said, and passed on. The man fell back at once and rejoined his companion. "'I told you so,' he said. "'That man is a deal too old. He said his name was Fane. "'It's the other one in the tower wig, as I said from the first. "'That ain't real air. It's the wig as alters him.' John posted his letter, saw it slide past the recall, and then walked back to the hotel, found Archie in the sitting-room reading the playbills for the evening, and told him. Perhaps nothing is more characteristic of our fellow-creatures than the manner in which they bear unexpected reverses of fortune. Archie had some of the callousness of feeling for others which accompanies lack of imagination. He had never put himself in the place of others. He was not likely to begin now. He had no intention of hurting John by setting his iron heel on his face. He had no idea people minded being trodden on. And indeed, as John stood by the window with his hands clasped behind his back, he was as indifferent as he appeared to be to anything that Archie, pacing up and down the room with flashing eyes, could say. He had at last closed the iron gates of the irrevocable behind himself, and he was at first too much stunned by the clang even to hear what the excited young man was talking about. Perhaps it was just as well. "'By Jove!' Archie was saying as John's attention came slowly back. "'To think of the old governor at Overley, poor old chap! He's missed it all his best years, but I hope he'll live to enjoy it yet. I do, indeed!' Archie felt he could afford to be generous. "'And die, John, dear old die, shall come and queen it at Overley. And she shall have a suitable fortune. I'll make father do the right thing by die. He won't want to do more than he can help, because she's never been much of a daughter to him, but he shall.' 
when it's known she'll marry off quick enough, <laughs> I'll see it gets about. And don't you be downhearted, John. We'll do the right thing by you. You know you never cared for the money when you had it. You're always a bit of a screw to yourself as well as to others. I will say that for you. But uh, let me see. You allowed me three hundred a year. Don't you wish now it had been four? For you shall have the same if the old gov agrees. And I dare say I shall be a bit freer with a ten-pound note now and then than ever you were to me. There will be no necessity for this reckless generosity, said John, wondering why he did not writhe as a man might who watches a knife cut into his benumbed limb. It gave him no pain. And you shall have a hunter, continued Archie. By Jove, what hunting I shall have! I shall get the governor to add another wing to the stables, and I'll keep Quicksilver for you, John. You mustn't turn rusty because the luck has come to us at last. <laughs> you know I knew all along I ought to have been the heir, and I put up with your being there and never raised a dust. I think I can promise I shall not raise a dust, said John dispassionately, watching the knife turn in his flesh. And, and, continued Archie, why, I, I need not marry money now. I could take my pick. New Vista seemed to open at every turn. His weak mouth fell ajar. My word, John, times are changed, and by debts I can pay them off. And run up more, said John. It is an ill wind that blows nobody any good. I don't call it much of an ill wind, said Archie, chuckling. Not much of an ill wind. In spite of himself, John laughed aloud at the naivety of Archie's remark. That it was an ill wind to John had not even crossed his mind. It would cross dies, though, John thought. She would do him justice. But, alas, from the few who will do us justice, we always want so much more, something infinitely greater than justice. At least John did. The early table d'hôte dinner broke in on Archie's soliloquy, and, much to John's relief, that favoured young gentleman discovered that a lady of his acquaintance was dancing at one of the theatres that evening, and he determined to go and see her. He could not persuade John to accompany him, even though he offered, with the utmost generosity, to introduce him to her. "'Well, if you won't, you won't,' said Archie, seeing his persuasions did not avail, and much preferring to go by himself. "'If you'd rather sit over the fire in the dumps, that's your affair, not mine. Ta-da! I expect you would have turned in before I'm back. By the way, can you lend me five thickens?' John was on the point of refusing, when he remembered that the actual money he had with him was more Archie's than his. "'Thank ye,' said Archie. "'You part easier than you used to. I expect it'll be the last time I shall borrow of you, eh, <laughs> John? It'll be the other way about in future.' "'Will it?' said John, as he put back his pocket-book. Archie laughed and went out. "'Oh, it is good to be young and handsome and admired. The dancers pirouetted in the intense electric light, and the music played on every chord of Archie's light, pleasure-loving soul and he clapped and applauded with the rest, his pulse leaping high and higher. A sense of triumph possessed him. His one thorn in the flesh was gone for ever. He rode on the top of the wave. He had had all else before, and now the one thing that was lacking to him had come. He was rich, rich, rich. There was much goods laid up for many years of pleasure. Archie touched the zenith. It was very late, or rather it was very early, when he walked home through the deserted streets. A great mental exultation was still upon him, but his body was exhausted, and the cool night air and the silence, after the babble of tongues and the shrieking choruses and the flaring lights of the last few hours, were pleasant to his aching eyes and head. The dawn stretched like a drawn sword behind the city. The Seine lay a long line of winding mist under its many bridges. The ruins of the scorched Tuileries pushed up against the sky. Archie leant a moment on the parapet, and looked down to the Seine below, whispering in its shroud. He took off his hat and pushed back the light curling hair from his forehead, laughing softly to himself. An invisible boat, with a red blur coming downstream, was making a low, continuous warning sound. A hand came suddenly over his shoulder and was pressed upon his mouth, and at the same instant something exceeding sharp and swift, pointed with death, pierced his back once and again. 
Archie saw his hat drop over the parapet into the mist. He tried to struggle, but in vain. He was choking. "'It's a dream,' he said. "'I shall wake. I've dreamt it before.' He looked wildly round him. The steadfast dawn was witnessed from afar. There was the boat still passing downstream. There was the city before him with its spars piercing the mist. Was it a dream? The hot blood rushed up into his mouth. The drenched hand released its pressure. "'I shall wake,' he said, and he fell forward on his face. End of Volume 3 Chapter 13Volume 3, Chapter 14 of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume 3, Chapter 14 The earth buildeth on the earth castles and towers. The earth saith to the earth, All shall be ours. The earth walketh on the earth, glistering like gold. The earth goeth to the earth sooner than it wold. John was late next morning. He had not slept for many nights, and the heavy slumber of entire exhaustion fell on him towards dawn. It was nearly midday when he re-entered the sitting-room where he had sat up so late the night before. He went to Archie's room to see whether he had come in, but it was empty. He was impatient to be gone, to get away from that marble-topped side-table and the horsehair chairs and the gilt clock on the mantelpiece. At least, he thought he wished to get away from these things, but it was from himself that he really wanted to get away, from his miserable, tortured self that was all that was left of him in this his hour of weakness and prostration, the hour which inevitably succeeds all great exertions of strength. How could he drag this wretched creature about with him? He had hoarded himself. The thought of being with himself was intolerable. It seems hard that the nobler side of human nature which can cheer and urge its weaker brother up such steep paths of duty and self-sacrifice, should desert us when the summit is achieved, leaving the weaker to wail unreproved over its bleeding feet and rent garments till we madden at the sound. An overwhelming sense of loneliness fell on John as he sat waiting for Archie to come in. He had no strong, earnest, steadfast self to bear him company. He felt deserted, lost. Who has not experienced it, that fierce depression and loathing of all life, which, though at the time we know it not, is only the writhing and fainting of the starved human affections? The very ordinary sources from which the sharpest suffering springs shows us later on how narrow are the limits within which our common human nature works, and from which yet irradiates such diversities of pain. Alphonse disturbed him at last to seek whether he and Monsieur would dine at table d'hôte. Monsieur, with a glance at Archie's door, had not yet come in. John said they would both dine, and then, roused somewhat by the interruption, an idea struck him. Had Archie, in the excitement of the moment, gone back to England without telling him? He went to the room, but there was no evidences of departure. On the bed the clothes were thrown which Archie had worn on the previous day. The gold watch John had given him was on the dressing-table. He had evidently left it there on purpose not caring, perhaps, to risk taking it with him. All the paraphernalia of a man who studies his appearance was strewed on the table. There was his little moustache-brush, and fire of brillantine to burnish it. John knew that he would never have left that behind. Archie had evidently intended to return. In the meanwhile, hour succeeded hour, but he did not come. That Archie should have been out all night was not surprising, but that he should be still out now in his evening clothes in the daytime, began to be incomprehensible. After a few premonitory tremors of misgiving, which, manlike, he laughed at himself for entertaining, John took alarm. Evening fell, and still no Archie, and then a hideous night followed in which John forgot everything in heaven above or earth beneath except Archie. The police were informed. The actress at whose house he had supped after the play was interviewed, but could only vociferate between her sobs that he had left her house with the remainder of her party in the early hours of the morning, and she had not seen him since. Directly the office opened, John telegraphed to his colonel 
to know if he had returned to London. The answer came, absent without leave. John remembered that he had only three days' leave, and that the third day was up yesterday. Archie would not have forgotten that. A nightmare of a day passed. John had been out during the greater part of it, rushing back at intervals in the hope there was no longer anything but a mask to despair, of finding Archie in his rooms on his return. In the dusk of the afternoon he came back once more, and peered for the twentieth time into the littered bedroom which the frightened servants had left exactly as Archie had left it. He was standing in the doorway looking into the empty room, where a certain horror was beginning to gather round the familiar objects with which it was strewed, when a voice spoke to him. It was the superintendent of police to whom he had gone long ago, the night before, when first the horror began. Alphonse, who had shown him up, was watching through the doorway. The man said something in French. But it did not mutter much. He knew. They went downstairs together. Alphonse brought him his hat and stick. The other waiters were gathered in a little knot at the table d'hote door. A fiacre was waiting under the archway. John and the superintendent got into it, and it drove off at once without waiting for directions. They were lighting the lamps in the streets. The dusk was falling, falling like the shadow of death. They drove deeper and ever deeper into it. Time ceased to be. "'Nous voici, monsieur,' said the man, gravely, as they pulled up before a building, the long low outline of which was dimly visible. John knew it was the morgue. He followed his guide down a whitewashed passage into a long room. There was a cluster of people at the further end toward which the man was leading him, and in the dusk there was a subdued whispering and a sound of trickling water. As they reached the further end, someone turned on the electric light, and it fell full on a man's figure on one of the slabs. A little crowd of people was peering through the glass screen at the toy which the Seine had tired of and cast aside. Ah, qu'il est beau, said a high woman's voice. John shaded his eyes and looked. The face was turned away, but John knew the hair, fair to whiteness in that brilliant light, as he had often seen it in London ballrooms. They let him through the glass screen which kept off the crowd, and, uh, oblivious of the many eyes watching him, John bent over the slab and touched the clenched marble hand with the signet grin on it which he had given him when they were at Oxford together. Yes, it was Archie. The dead face was set in the nervous grin with which he had been wont in life to meet the inevitable and the distasteful. The blue pencillings of dissolution had touched to inexorable distinctness the thin lines of dissipation in the cheek and at the corners of the mouth. The death of the body had overtaken the creeping death of the soul. Their landmarks met. A poor, beautiful, effeminate face, devoid of all that makes death bearable, stared up at the electric light. An impotent, overwhelming compassion as for some ephemeral, irresponsible being of another creation, who knows not how to guide itself in this grim world of law, and has wandered blindfold within the sweep of a vast machinery of which it knew nothing, wrung John's heart. He hid his face in his hands. End of Volume 3, Chapter 14《Volume Three, Chapter Fifteen of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume Three, Chapter Fifteen. For human bless and woe in the frail thread of human life are all so closely twined that till the shears of fate the texture shred, the close succession cannot be disjoined. Nor dare we from our hour judge that which comes behind. Sir Walter Scott. Di had seen her father and Archie off on their journey to Brighton, and, having arranged to replace her brother in three days' time, was surprised when a hasty note, the morning after their departure, informed her that Archie had been recalled to London on business, and that she must go to her father at once. Mrs. Courtney was incensed. Archie had shirked before, and now he had shirked again but Colonel Tempest remained in far too precarious a condition for her to refuse to allow her granddaughter to go, as she would certainly otherwise have done. 
so Di went off the morning after the speaker's party. She had told Mrs. Courtney that she had met John there. "'In one way I am glad to have met him,' she said firmly, her proud lip quivering. "'Any uncertainty I may have been weak enough to feel is at an end, and it was time the end should come. For, in spite of all you said, I had a lingering idea that if we met—' "'And now we have met, and he's evidently no wish to see me again.' Mrs. Courtney looked fixedly at the beautiful, pallid face, and wondered that she'd ever wished to die had a heart. "'This pain will pass,' she said gently. "'You have always believed me, die. Believe me now. Take courage and wait. You've had an untroubled life till now. That has passed. Trouble has come. It is part of life. It will pass, too. Not the feeling, perhaps, but the suffering.' "'Good-bye, my child,' she said a little later kissing the girl's cold cheek with a tenderness which Jodai was powerless to return. "'Take care of yourself. Go out every day. The sea air will do you good. And tell your father I cannot spare you more than a fortnight.' Di would have given anything to show her grandmother that she was thankful. Oh, how thankful in this grey world! For her sympathy and love. But she had no words. She kissed Mrs. Courtney and went down to the cab. Mrs. Courtney remained motionless until she heard it drive away. Then she let two tears run down from below her spectacles and wiped them away. No more followed them. The old cannot give way like the young. Mrs. Courtney had once said that nothing had power to touch her very nearly, but she was still vulnerable on one point. Her old heart, warm with so many troubles, ached for her granddaughter. Thank God, she said to herself, that in the next world there will be neither marrying nor giving in marriage. Perhaps God Almighty sees it's a mistake. Di found Colonel Tempest wrapped up in a duvet in an armchair by the window of his sitting-room, in a state of equal indignation against his children for deserting him, and against the rain for blurring the sea-view from the window. With his nurse, it is hardly necessary to add, he was not on speaking terms, a fact which seemed to cause that patient, apathetic person very little annoyance, she being, as she told a die, accustomed to gentlemen. Dyth soothed him as best she could, took his tray from the nurse at the door so that he might be spared as much as possible the sight of the most hideous woman in the world, rang for lights, and drew a curtain before the untactful rain, while he disclaimed alternately on the enormity of Archie's behaviour and on the callousness of Mrs. Courtney in endeavouring to keep his daughter, his only daughter, away from him. Colonel Tempest and Archie detested Mrs. Courtney. However much the father and son might disagree and bicker on most subjects, they could always sing a little duet together in perfect harmony about her. Colonel Tempest began a feeble solo on that theme to die when he had finished with Archie. But die visibly froze, and somehow the subject, often as it was started, always dropped. Die, as Colonel Tempest frequently informed her, did not care to hear the truth about her grandmother. If she knew all that he did about her, and what her behaviour had been to him, she would not be so fond of her as she evidently was. Earlier in his illness, Di had been obliged to exercise patience with her father, but she needed none now. That is the one small compensation for deep trouble. It numbs the power of feeling small irritations. It is when it begins to lift somewhat, that the small irritations fit themselves out with new stings. Di had not reached that stage yet. The doctor, who came daily to see her father, looked narrowly at her, and ordered her to go out of doors as much as possible, in wet weather or fine. "'I sometimes take a little nap after luncheon,' said Colonel Tempest with dignity. "'You might go out then, Di.' "'Miss Tempest will in any case go out morning and afternoon,' said the doctor, with decision. Colonel Tempest had before had his doubts whether the doctor understood his case, but now they were confirmed. He wished to change doctors, and a painful scene ensued between him and Di, in the course of which a hole was kicked in the duvet and a cup of broth was upset. But it is an ascertained fact that women are not amenable to reason. Di sewed up the hole in the duvet, rubbed the carpet, and remained, as Colonel Tempest hysterically informed her, as obstinate as her mother before her. 
On the second morning after her arrival at Brighton, she was sitting with Colonel Tempest, reading the papers to him, when the waiter brought in the letters. There were none for her, two for her father. One was a foreign letter with a blue French stamp. She took them to him where he lay on the sofa. Colonel Tempest looked at them. Uh, "'Nothing from Archie again,' he said. "'He doesn't care even to write and ask whether I'm alive or dead.' "'Archie is not a good hand at writing,' said I, echoing, for the sake of saying something, the time-honoured masculine plea for exemption from the tedium of domestic correspondence. "'This is John's hand,' said Colonel Tempest. "'A Paris postmark? <laughs> These rich men do rush about.' Di had actually not known it was John's writing. She had never seen it, to her knowledge, but nevertheless it appeared to her extraordinary that she had not at once divined that it was his. She was not anxious to hear her father's comments on John's letter, or the threadbare remark, sacred to the poor relation, that when the rich one was sitting down to draw a cheque he might just as well have written it for double the amount. He would never have known the difference. The poor relation always knows exactly how much the rich one can afford to give. So Di told her father she was going out, and left the room. It stung her, as she raced her boots, to think that John had probably sent another cheque to cover their expenses at the hotel, and that the fried soles and semolina pudding which she had ordered for luncheon would be paid for by him. It exasperated her still more to know that whatever John sent, Colonel Tempest would have pronounced it to be me. Before she had finished lacing her boots, however, the sitting-room door was opened, and I heard her father calling wildly to her. Colonel Tempest was not allowed to move, except with great precaution, owing to the slow healing of the obstinate internal injury caused by that unlucky pistol-shot. She rushed headlong downstairs. "'Father!' she cried, horrified to find him standing on the landing. "'Father! Come back at once!' And she put her arms round him and supported him back to the sofa. He was trembling from head to foot. She saw that something had happened, but he was not in a state to be questioned. She administered what restorative she had at hand, and presently the constantly moving lips got out the words, "'Read it!' and Colonel Tempest pointed to the letter on the floor. "'Read it!' repeated Colonel Tempest, lying back on his cushions, and recovering from his momentary collapse. "'Read it!' Di picked up the letter and sat down by the window. She was suddenly too tired to stand. Her father was talking wildly, but she did not hear him, was calling to her to read it aloud, but she did not hear him. She saw only John's strong, small handwriting. It was a business letter, couched in the most matter-of-fact terms. John stated his case, expressed a formal regret that the facts he mentioned had not come to light at Mr. Tempest's death, mentioned that at the accumulation of income during his minority had fortunately remained untouched, that he desired his lawyer to communicate with Colonel Tempest, and signed himself John Fane. He had written the word Tempest, and had then struck it through. Di pressed her forehead against the glass on which the rain was beating. Was the emotion which was shattering her joy, or sorrow, or, or both? She knew it was joy. In a lightning flash of comprehension she realised that it was this awful calamity which had kept John silent, which had held him back from coming to her, from asking her to marry him. He loved her still. Love, dead and buried, had risen out of his grave. The impossible had happened. John loved her still. "'I cannot bear it,' she said. And for a moment the long yellow waves and her father's impatient voice, and even John's letter, were alike blotted out, unheard. Colonel Tempest considered Di's apathy, after she had read the letter, unfeeling and unsympathetic in the extreme, and he did not hesitate to tell her so. But when she presently turned her averted face towards him, he was already off on another tack, his excitement, which seemed to increase rather than diminish, tossing him as a wave tosses a spar. Twenty years, he said tremulously. Think of it, Di, not that you seem to care. Twenty years have I toiled and moiled in poverty. Twenty years have I and my children been ground down while that nameless interloper has spent our money right and left. Oh, my God, I've got it at last. I've got my own at last. But who will give me back those twenty years? And Colonel Tempest's voice broke into a sob. 
other consequences of that letter began to dawn on Di's awakening consciousness. "'Then John,' she said, bewildered, "'Oh, Father, what will become of John?' "'John,' said Colonel Tempest bitterly, "'is now just where I was twenty years ago, disinherited, penniless. He has kept me out all these years, and now at last Providence gives me my own. Is it to be hoped that Providence is not really responsible for all the shady transactions for which we offer up our best thanks? I dare say he is put by, continued Colonel Tempest. He's had time enough. You have not read the letter carefully, said Di. He only discovered all this less than three months ago, and you have been ill for more than two. Colonel Tempest did not hear her. He had ceased for the last twenty years to hear anything he did not want to. Fifty thousand a year, he went on, not a penny less. And the new river shares have gone up since Jack's day. And there was a large sum which rolled up during the minority. John's right there. There must be over a hundred thousand. You shall have that, die. Archie will kick, but you shall have it. Eight thousand pounds John settled on you a year ago. That was the amount of his generosity to my poor girl. You shall not have a penny less than a hundred thousand. Not during my lifetime, of course, but, but, but when I die— he added hastily. Di could articulate nothing. "'I shall pay my own debts and Archie's in a moment,' he continued, not noticing whether she answered or not. "'If you want a new gown, Di, you may send the bill to me. I don't believe I owe a thousand, and Archie not so much, poor lad, though John was always putting a long face over his debts. How deuce me John was from first to last! Well, do as you will be done by. I'll do for him alone what he thought enough for the two of you.' I'll never give him cause to say I'm close-fisted. He shall have your eight thousand, and he shall have three hundred a year, the same that he allowed Archie as well. He won't take it. Won't take it, said Colonel Tempest contemptuously. That's all you know about the world, Di. I tell you, he'll have to take it. I tell you, he has not a sixpence in the world at this moment, to say nothing of owing me twenty years' income. Colonel Tempest rambled on of how Archie should leave the army and live at Overley of how Di should live there too, and Mrs. Courtney might go to the devil. Presently he fell to wondering what state the shooting was in, and how many pheasants John was breeding at that moment. Every instant it became more unbearable, till at last Di sent for the nurse, made an excuse of posting her letters, and slipped out of the room. She went out to her old friends the yellow waves, and, too exhausted to walk, sat down under the lee of one of the high wooden rivets between which the sea licks the pebbly shore into grooves. Gradually the tension of her mind relaxed. Di sat and watched the waves until they washed away the high invalid voice vibrating in some acute recess of her brain, washed away the hideous thought that they were rich because John was penniless and dishonoured, washed away everything except the one fact that his silence was accounted for and that he loved her after all. Di looked out across the rain-trodden sea. If it was raining, she did not know it. What did anything in this wide world matter so long as John loved her? Poverty was nothing. Marriage was nothing either. What did it matter if they could not marry, so long as they loved each other? Once in a lifetime it is vouchsafed to like to the worldly and to the pure, to the earnest and to the frivolous, to discern that vision, which has been ever life's greatest reality or life's greatest illusion, according to the character of the beholder, that to love and to be loved is enough. A wet glint came across the sea, exquisite and evanescent as the gleam across Di's heart. It is enough, said Di, and her soul was flooded with a solemn joy a thousand times deeper than when she had first discovered her love for John and his for her, and a brilliant future was before her. Sorrow, with his pick, minds the heart. But he is a cunning workman. He deepens the channels whereby happiness may enter, and hollows out new chambers for joy to abide in when he is gone. End of Volume 3, Chapter 15 Volume Three, Chapter Sixteen of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Simon Evers. Volume 3, Chapter 16 Though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceeding small. Longfellow The doctor was sitting with Colonel Tempest on Di's return to the hotel, and Di perceived that her father, who was still in a very excited state, had been telling him about his sudden change of fortune. The doctor courteously offered his congratulations, and on leaving made a pretext of inquiring after Di's health, in order to see her alone. Oh, "'Colonel Tempest has been telling me of his unexpected access of wealth,' he said. "'In his present condition of nervous prostration and tendency to cerebral excitement, the information should most certainly have been withheld from him. His brain is not in a state to bear the strain which such an event might have put upon it, has put upon it. Were such a thing to occur again in his enfeebled condition, I cannot answer for the consequences. It was absolutely unforeseen, said Di. None of us had the remotest suspicion. He's been in the habit of reading his letters for the past month. They must be kept from him for the present, replied the doctor. Let them report to you in future, and use your own discretion about showing them to him after you've read them yourself. Your father must be guarded from all agitation. This was more easily said than done. Nothing could turn Colonel Tempest's shattered, restless mind from hopping like a grasshopper on that one subject for the remainder of the day. The bit of cork in his medicine, which at another time would have elicited a torrent of indignation, excited only a momentary attention. He talked without ceasing, hinted darkly at a danger to John which that young man's creditable though tardy action had averted, alluded to passages in his own life which nothing would induce him to divulge and then, lighting on a sentimental vein, discoursed of a happy old age, the old age of fiction, in which he should see Archie's and Di's children playing in the gallery at Overley. And the old name? Di had not realised, until her parent descanted upon the subject in a way that set her teeth on edge, how hideous, how vulgar, is the seamy side of pride of birth. When Colonel Tempest began to dwell on the goodness and the grace that on his birth had smiled, Shall we blame Di if she put on the clock half an hour and rang for the nurse? Things were not much better next morning. Di gave strict orders that all letters and telegrams should be brought to her room. Colonel Tempest fidgeted because he had not heard from the lawyer in whose hands John had placed the transfer of the property. The letter was in Di's pocket, but she dared not give it to him, for though it contained nothing to agitate him, she knew that the fact that she had opened it would raise a whirlwind. "'But Archie,' said Colonel Tempest querulously, I, "'I ought to have heard from him, too. "'If John told him the same day that he wrote to me, "'we, we ought to have heard from Archie this morning. "'I should have imagined that though Archie did not give his father a thought when he was poor, "'he might have thought him worthy of a little consideration now.' "'If that is the motive you would have given him if he had written, "'it is just as well he has not,' said Di. "'But she wondered at his silence nevertheless. "'But she did not wonder long.' She left her father busily writing to an imaginary lawyer, for he had neither the name nor address of John's, and on the landing met a servant bringing a telegram to her room. She took it upstairs, and there it was addressed to her father, opened it. She had no apprehension of evil. The old are afraid of telegrams, but the young have made them common, and have worn out their prestige. The telegram was from John, merely stating that Archie had been taken seriously ill. Di's heart gave a leap of thankfulness that her father had been spared this further shock. But Archie, seriously ill. She was indignant at John's vague statement. What did seriously ill mean? Why could he not say what was the matter? And how could she keep the fact of his illness from her father? Ought she to go at once to Archie? Seriously ill. How like a man to send a telegram of that kind! She would telegram at once to John for particulars, and go or stay according as the doctor thought she could or could not safely leave her father. Di put on her walking things and ran out to the post office round the corner, where she dispatched a peremptory telegram to John, and then, seeing there was no one else to advise her, hurried to the doctor's house close at hand. For a wonder he was in. For a greater still his last patient walked out as she walked in. The doctor, with the quickness of his kind, saw the difficulty and caught up his hat to come with her. 
"'You shall go to your brother if you can,' was the only statement to which he would commit himself during the two minutes' walk in the rain, the two minutes which sealed Colonel Tempest's fate. No one knew exactly how it happened. Perhaps the hall porter had gone to his dinner, and the little boy who took his place for half an hour brought up the telegram to the person to whom it was addressed. No one knew afterwards how it had happened. It did happen. That was all. Colonel Tempest had the pink paper in his hand as the doctor and Di entered the room. He was laughing softly to himself. "'Ah, she is dead!' he said, chuckling. "'That is what John would like me to believe. But I know better. It is John that is dead. It is John who had to be snuffed out. Swain said so, and he knew. John says it's Archie, and he will write. <laughs> we know better, eh, doctor? Eh, Di? John's dead. Eight and twenty years old he was, but he's dead at last. He won't write any more. He won't spend my money any more. He won't keep me out any more. Colonel Tempest dropped on his knees. The only prayer he knew rose to his lips. For what we're going to receive, the Lord make us truly thankful. For an awful day and night, the fierce flame of delirium leaped and fell, and ever leaped again. With set face, Di stood hour after hour in the blast of the furnace, till doctor and nurse marvelled at her courage and endurance. On the evening of the second day, John came. He had written to tell Colonel Tempest of his coming, but the letter had not been opened. The doctor, thinking he was Di's brother, brought him into the sick-room, too crowded with fearful images for his presence to be noticed by the sick man. "'John is dead!' the high-pitched, terrible voice was saying. "'Blood ring fools! First there was the railway, but Goodwin saved him. Damn his officiousness! And then there was the far! They nearly had him that time. How grey he looked! Burned to ashes! Bandaged up to the eyes! But he got better. And then the carnival! They muffed it again!' Oh, Lord, how slow they were! But— The voice sank to a frightful whisper. They got him in Paris. I don't know how they did it. It's a secret. But they trapped him at last. Suddenly the glassy eyes looked with horrified momentary recognition at John. Written from the dead, continued the voice. I knew he would get up again. I always said he would, and he has. You can't kill John. There's no grave deep enough to hold him. Look at him, with his head out now, and the earth upon his hair. We ought to put a monument over him to keep him down. He's getting up. I tell you, I did not do it. The grave's not big enough. Swain dug it for him when he was a little boy, a little boy at school. Di turned her colourless face to John, and smiled at him, as one on the rack might smile at a friend, to show that the anguish is not unbearable. She felt no surprise at seeing him. She was past surprise. She had forgotten that she had ever doubted his love. In silence he took the hand she held out towards him, and kept it in a strong, gentle clasp that was more comfort than any words. Hour after hour they watched and ministered together, and hour by hour the lamp of life flared grimly low and lower. And after he had told everything, everything, everything that he had concealed in life, after John and I had heard, in awed compassion and forgiveness, every word of the guilty secret which he had kept under lock and key so many years, at last the tide of remembrance ebbed away, and life with it. Did he know them in the quiet hours that followed? Did he recognize them? They bent over him. They spoke to him gently, tenderly. Did he understand? They never knew. And so, in the grey of an April morning, poor Colonel Tempest, unconscious of death, which had had so many terrors for him in life, drifted tranquilly upon its tide from the human compassion that watched by him here to the infinite pity beyond. End of Volume 3 Chapter 16《Vol. 3 — The Conclusion — of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. — Vol. 3 — Conclusion — Where there are twa seeking, there will be a finding. 
After John had taken Di back to London, he returned to Brighton, and from thence to Overday to arrange for the double funeral. He had not remembered to mention that he was coming, and in the dusk of a wet afternoon he walked up by the way of the wood, and let himself in at the little postern in the wall. He had not thought he should return to Overley again. Yet here he was once more in the dim gallery, with its faint scent of potpourri, his hand as he passed stirring it from long habit. The pictures craned through the twilight to look at him. He stole quietly upstairs and along the garret gallery. The nursery door was open. A glow of light fell on Mitty's figure. What was she doing? John stopped short and looked at her, and with a sudden recollection as of some previous existence, understood. Mitty was packing. Two large white grocery boxes were already closed and corded in one corner. John saw Best Cubes printed on them, and it dawned upon his slow masculine consciousness that those boxes were part of Mitty's luggage. Mitty was standing in the middle of the room, holding at arm's length a little red flannel dressing-gown, which knocked twenty years off John's age as he looked. "'I should take it,' she said half aloud. "'It's worn as thin as thin behind. That and the open socks as I've mended and better be mended.' And she thrust them both hastily, as if for fear she should repent, into a tin box, out of which the battered head of John's old horse protruded. If there was one thing certain in this world— it was that the Noah's Ark could not go in unless the horse came out. Mitty tried many ways, and was contemplating with them with arms akimbo, when John came in. She showed no surprise at seeing him, and with astonishment John realised that it was only six days since he had left Overley. It was actually not yet a week since that far distant afternoon, separated from the present by such a chasm, when he had lain on his face in the heather, and the deep passions of youth had rent him and let him go. Here at Overley, time stopped. He came back twenty years older, and the almanac on his writing-table marked six days. John made the necessary arrangements for the funeral to take place at midnight, according to the Tempest custom, which he knew Colonel Tempest would have been the last to wave. He wrote to tell Di what he had settled, together with the hour and date. He dared not advise her not to be present. But he remembered the vast concourse of people who had assembled at his father's funeral to see the torchlight procession, and he hoped she would not come. But Mrs. Courtney wrote back that her granddaughter was fixed in her determination to be present, that she had reluctantly consented to it, and would accompany her herself. She added in a postscript that no doubt John would arrange for them to stay the night at Overley, and they should return to London the next day. The night of the funeral was exceeding dark and still, so still that many, watching from a distance on Moat Hill, heard the voice saying, I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And again, We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The night was so calm that the torches burned upright and unwavering, casting a steadfast light on church and graveyard and tilted tombstones, on the crowded darkness outside, and on the worn faces of a man and woman who stood together between two open graves. John and I exchanged no word as they drove home. There were lights and a fire in the music-room, and she went in there and began absently to take off her hat and long crape veil. Mrs. Courtney had gone to bed. John followed to die with a candle in his hand. He offered it to her, but she did not take it. "'It is good-bye as well as good-night,' he said, holding out his hand. "'I must leave here very early to-morrow.' Di took no notice of his outstretched hand. She was looking into the fire. "'You must rest,' he said gently, trying to recall her to herself. A swift tremor passed over her face. "'You're right,' she said in a low voice. "'I will rest, when I've had five minutes' talk with you.' John shut the door and came back to the far side. He believed he knew what was coming, and his face hardened. It was bitter to him that Di thought it worth while to speak to him on the subject. She ought to have known him better. 
She faced him with difficulty, but without hesitation. They looked each other in the eyes. "'You are going to London early to see your lawyer,' she said, "'on the subject that you wrote to father about.' "'I am.' "'That is why I must speak to you to-night. I dare not wait.' Her eyes fell before the stern intentness of his. Her voice faltered a moment, and then went on. "'John, don't go. It's not necessary. Don't grieve me by leaving Overly, or, or changing your name.' A great bitterness welled up in John's heart against the woman he loved, the bitterness which sooner or later few men escape, of realising how feeble is a woman's perception of what is honourable or dishonourable in a man. "'Ah, Di,' he said, "'you are very generous, but do not let us speak of it again. Such a thing could not be.' He took her hand, but she withdrew it instantly. "'John,' she said with dignity, "'you misunderstand me. It would be a poor kind of generosity in me to offer what it is impossible for you to accept. You wound me by thinking I could do such a thing. I only meant to ask you to keep your present name and home for a little while until they both will become yours again by right, the day when you marry me." A beautiful colour had mounted to Di's face. John's became white as death. "'Do you love me?' he said hoarsely, shaking from head to foot. "'Yes,' she replied, trembling as much as he. He held her in his arms. The steadfast heart that understood and loved him beat against his own. Die, he stammered. Die. And they wept and clung together like two children. End of the conclusion to volume three. Postscript Mitty's packing was never finished. Why, she did not understand. But John, who helped her to rearrange her things, understood, and that was enough for her. For many springs and spring cleanings the horse-chestnut buds peered in at the nursery windows, and found her still within. I think the wishes of Mitty's heart all came to pass, and that she loved Miss Dinah. But nevertheless I believe that, to the end of her life, she never quite ceased to regret the little kitchen that John had spoken of, where she would have made rock buns for her lamb, and waited on him hand and foot. End of postscript. End of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley.